cats. Animals have been accompanying humans for millennia. In ancient Egypt, this close relationship took on a special dimension. Many deities were worshipped in animal form. We think it's a symbol of power. Ancient Egyptians believed that animals were also the ideal intermediaries to convey their requests to the gods. Animals were mummified in temples similar to the pharaohs. Countless animal mummies have been found in catacombs. But little is known about the reasons behind these religious rites. Researchers are now busy attempting to shed some light on this, using cutting-edge technology, examining embalmed cats, dogs, and other animals. An incredible number of animal mummies were destroyed in the 19th century. 180,000 cat mummies. And yet, their number appears to be gigantic even now. What was commonplace for the old Egyptians is still an unsolved mystery of science today. When the sun rises above the Nile, dwellers of the valley have already been awake for quite some time. Work in the villages needs to be finished before the midday sun forces humans and animals alike into the shade. Even today, pets and livestock are part of the people's daily lives here at the Great River, just as they have always been. After all, Egypt was and still is a land of farmers. Without the labor of animals, the old pharaonic kingdom could never have risen to its former glory. And animals are still cheaper to maintain here than machines. For better or worse, Egypt depends on the water of the Nile, which brings fertility. Over millennia, countless donkey generations have carried water and goods into the settlements. Humans and animals share similar fates here. Ancient Egyptians also built their mighty temples and palace complexes along the banks of the Nile. This is where the rulers of the land lived and where they worshipped a plethora of gods. This cult was central to Egyptian culture. It was meant to safeguard this for future generations. The first foreigners to arrive in this fascinating country made an astonishing discovery. Many of the deities worshipped by ancient Egyptians were associated with animals. A find from the early period of the kingdom shows the first pharaoh, Nama, as a victorious conqueror. Shown rising above him is Horus, the god of the heavens, who is depicted as a falcon. It is he who bestows power upon the ruler. For the ancient Egyptians, their gods were formed very early on. They were very much closer to nature in 4,000, 5,000 BC. So when their gods emerged, they were associated with particular animals because they had the trait of that creature. The excavation team led by American archeologist René Friedman unearthed the tombs of rulers from the time of Egypt's rise to a superpower of antiquity. They were all buried with many animals surrounding them, and it's unique in Egypt. We don't know exactly why they chose to do this, but we think it's a symbol of power. It's a symbol of their wealth and uh, their control of nature. Mankind and animals appeared to be inseparably united as guarantors of stability and prosperity during three millennia of ancient Egyptian history. Almost their entire pantheon of gods is represented by animals. Next to the warlike falcon Horus is the mother goddess Hathor. Depicted as a cow, she is responsible for love, beauty, peace, art and music. After mummification, the deceased are guided to the land of the dead by the dog-headed Anubis. But what's more, the old graveyards are also the last resting places for mummified animals. Cats, mice, crocodiles and dogs in copious numbers. 
People have always known about human mummies, but not that many people until relatively recently were aware that there are animal mummies. Salima Ikram teaches archaeology at the American University in Cairo. She is a leading expert for ancient Egyptian mummies. Together with her students, she reconstructs the mummification techniques that Greek historian Herodotus observed and recorded some 2,500 years ago. This Nile perch is covered with a mixture of clay and sodium bicarbonate. It is stored in this dry bath until its body has become completely desiccated. This has the effect of depriving putrefactive bacteria of their nutritional base. Subsequently, it is treated with a blend of various oils to keep the body supple and prevent the renewed absorption of moisture. For a human body, this procedure used to take about 70 days. For a fish, a few hours would suffice. When you have an animal in the image of the god and that is given as a sacrifice, it's more likely that this creature will be able to speak to the god and intercede on behalf of the pilgrim more than anything else. One of the biggest animal cemeteries of the Pharaonic Kingdom is located in Tuna el Gebel. A German Egyptian team is exploring this former Middle Egyptian sanctuary. Melanie Flossman serves as the excavation director. I've been working here at the Tuna El Gebel excavation site for 12 years. It's a beautiful stretch of desert. We have a beautiful excavation house on the ancient grounds, along with a starlit sky at night. We live and work here together with all of the local excavators. A heavily guarded shaft that leads down to the tomb. The necropolis was once part of the lost temple of Thoth, the ancient Egyptian deity. Thoth was considered to the god of the moon, science, writing, and wisdom. According to pious legend, he created hieroglyphics. Ibis and baboons, the sacred animals of Thoth, were buried in clay jars in the subterranean corridors. Melanie Flossman and her Egyptian colleague, Mustafa, want to get a first impression of this burial site's condition. During the Arab Spring, armed gangs took advantage of the power vacuum and operated in this region. Did they also intrude in this sacred area? The ibis jars are preserved in their original position there. They still support the ceiling. The ibis jars were stacked several meters high from the ground to below the ceiling. A first glimmer of hope. A few urns located in a side corridor have remained intact. Over here are another five mummies, nicely wrapped in linen and very well preserved, a tomb that hasn't been ransacked by tomb raiders. Many animal mummies were adorned with gold-gilded face masks, tempting loot. In 2013, pillagers intruded into the archaeologists' secured excavation storerooms, which were also located down here. They killed the guards robbed the masks and left behind a trail of destruction. Time and again, the team comes across impressive works of art in Thoth's graveyard. The main god of the animal necropolis. This is the face, the beak. Thoth was associated with writing and wisdom. Now, the ibis, this elegant bird, has a beak that is like a pen, and it is always going down with its head searching. So the idea of questing for wisdom, for whatever, is associated with that bird. The work down here is dangerous. Time and again, parts of this tunnel system cave in. And gaping pits lie concealed beneath the sand. Archaeologists have to navigate carefully down here. The main tunnels branch off in all directions into narrow corridors, a dangerous labyrinth for the unacquainted. Melanie and Mustafa explore one of these countless corridors. The underground necropolis comprises an intricate network of burial chambers and corridors. To this day, its full extent has yet to be mapped. 
Can you hold me the lamp, please? Thank you. Okay, so I go first. Access to the side corridors has been cleared, but with every step, you take a chance. And if you suffer from claustrophobia, this isn't a place you want to be. Rock fragments from the tunnel walls regularly come loose. So you can give me the lamp? Sweltering heat and a lack of oxygen make advancing quite strenuous. Take care. Watch your head. The tunnel labyrinth stretches several hundred meters beneath the sands of Tunel Gebel. Tomb raiders trying to cover their tracks had set fire to it at one point. With every step, soot and bat droppings whirl up fine dust that mutes the sounds. Breathing through a protective mask is strenuous. Millions of animal urns were once carefully stacked here. Sinkholes and grave robbers have left an expanse of rubble. The archaeologists are forced to climb across large piles of shattered mummy vessels. Salima Ikram describes the erstwhile splendor of this burial site. The idea that these catacombs stretch for kilometers all around you and that each one is beautifully or was beautifully filled with these pots and then sealed up, it's just such a testament to people's belief. The atmosphere is wonderful and strange and compelling and it is really a very exciting place to be. Melanie Flossman is in search of animal mummies that haven't been destroyed so she can x-ray and examine them at the lab. These are the remains of bird mummies, perhaps falcons or ibis. In Tuna El Gebel, animal remains were mummified using two different methods. In the early period, fibers and flesh were dissolved from the bones. Other burials took place with all the feathers and body parts intact after mummifying the body with bitumen, various oils and resins, and then wrapping it in linen. Not only were the sacred animals of the Egyptians buried in Tuna El Gebel, Temple priests also wanted to enter into eternity by way of these magnificently adorned burial chambers. Today, the chambers are being surveyed so that the complex can be virtually reconstructed and made accessible for eternity. How's it going? Any of these chambers, after all, could collapse and be lost forever. Patrick is still surveying. This is Newt, goddess of the sky, who devours the sun disk in the evening and bears it back in the morning. The sun disk wanders through the body of Newt. The deceased let themselves be protected by sky deities in the image of animals. To keep evil at bay, which lurked everywhere on the long path to eternity, their appearance had to be frightening. The old Egyptians firmly believed in magical protective and defensive powers of various animal species. Hope of an afterlife led to the emergence of a unique funerary cult in ancient Egypt. For a long time, it was a privilege reserved for the ruling family and high-ranking dignitaries of the kingdom. Their bodies were elaborately embalmed in the cultic centers, Later, the souls of the deceased could return to the conserved bodies, so that the deceased could make their journey into eternal life fully restored. A mummified pharaoh on a funerary barge floats to eternity on the Nile. But before the mummy can be buried on the west bank, in the direction of sunset, the deceased is subjected to an elaborate ritual. The most important part of the internment takes place in front of the tomb, the opening of the mouth ceremony. The deity of death, Anubis, personally directs this ceremony. This is, in any case, what the people of ancient Egypt believed. A 
Anubis oversees the proper provisioning of the deceased with all that is necessary, as well as oversees the judgment of the dead. Dogs, foxes, jackals, anything that looked dog-like was associated with Anubis um, and Webwawit, the openers of the ways, because these were creatures that went into the desert and they explored and they were comfortable there. If you wanted protection in these places, you would choose the creatures that were most comfortable there, and that's why you would wind up with having Anubis, who in fact is not just a dog or a jackal, He's a super canid. He's made up of these different animals so that he has the power of every creature in the desert. By means of a sophisticated algorithm, Jakub Yedrzejewski takes 2D burial chamber photos and composes them into a 3D model. The advantage to this model is that we can now see, without the texture, the dimensions of the chamber. We can see that the chamber is distorted at the entrance. Perhaps it was built like this, or perhaps external forces, an earthquake, for example, caused parts of the chamber to come down and necessitated the redesigning of the entrance. The virtual model clearly shows the alarming condition of this tomb complex. The grave is endangered. The necropolis's poor state of preservation and the damages suffered by the archaeologist's stack rooms requires a rather unconventional approach to further explorations. Melanie Flossman is forced to look for information concerning the original appearance of the animal necropolis in museums and archives. Although there are so many mummies and we have complex catacombs and sometimes remnants of temples, it is shocking how little we know about the real functioning of this cult. The Rice Engelhorn Museums in Mannheim exhibits a collection of animal mummies from Tuna El Gebel that was excavated decades ago and legally exported following the system of partage. Exporting archaeological finds nowadays is strictly forbidden. Scientists examined these animal mummies and made a surprising discovery. This is the Egyptian god Thot, first in the image of an ibis and then as a baboon, symbols of wisdom and secret knowledge. Live baboons served as oracle animals in the subterranean ritual chambers of the animal necropolis. Believers worshipped them and asked their counsel. Priests descended into the animal necropolis at night to lie down and sleep. And as they dreamt, their questions to the oracle were answered by the sacred animal. Re-emerging from the animal necropolis the next morning, they could deliver answers to the supplicants. The Rice Engelhorn Museums have an extraordinarily large animal mummy, a gazelle in their collection. We have found out that it was colorfully painted. One can still find traces of red on the facial section of the linen cloth, where the artist tried to imitate eyes. And you can also still see well-preserved fur at the back of the body. Mummified gazelles were surely the exception, even in ancient Egypt. Not only very large animals, but also very small ones were embalmed. Animals you wouldn't expect. Here we have two shrews. Interestingly, they come in two completely different types of coffins. One with a removable little side panel, the other, larger coffin, has a completely removable lid featuring a shrew figure. And the bundle within contains the animal mummy. In Egypt, the pharaoh had favorite animals, just like everyone else. Pets that were buried with their deceased master at his regular burial site. In recent times, there has been renewed interest in funerals for beloved pets. 
though mummification in the pharaonic kingdom is, and always has been, very unusual indeed. These days, especially dogs and cats are seen as companions and family members whose loss is intensely felt. People want to keep alive the memory of years spent together, and this entails elaborate grieving rituals. At the Animal Crematorium, efforts are made to deal respectfully with animals and people, even though, in the end, it's all about incinerating a body using modern technology. But pet owners are given time to say goodbye to their animal. Modern animal crematoriums use the same technology that is used to cremate human bodies. Month for month, up to 250 animal bodies, from canaries to horses, are incinerated. It takes all but 20 minutes to cremate a medium-sized animal. All that will remain is ash. The bone remnants are carefully swept up, while the grieving wait outside for the mortal remains. In addition to urns in many forms, also animal-shaped ones, mourners can permanently take possession of a very special ash receptacle. This here is one such piece, a crystal ball, specially made for the mourners, containing the ash of their animals. The ash is filled into the sphere in a glass manufactory. It's a one-of-a-kind piece. Conventional urns can be taken home by the pet's owner. Alternatively, the pet can be laid to rest at a pet cemetery. It gives people a place for remembrance, and this helps with the grieving process. When animals are buried nowadays, it has more to do with people's personal connection with their pets. It's a private, familial matter. In Egypt, of course, it was subordinated to a big religious system. For conservation purposes, animal mummies must be stored in specially air-conditioned display cases. Opening these entails an elaborate procedure. What looks like a fully intact bird mummy from Tuna El Gebel is displayed behind armored glass, but looks are deceiving, as Stephanie Sesh, an anthropologist, has discovered. Using computer tomography, we could see that this bundle doesn't contain a whole bird mummy, but rather a mix of substances of various densities. It's thus a composition rather than a complete bird skeleton. X-ray vision that looks behind the still tightly wrapped linen bandages reinforces the archaeologists' long-held suspicions. Fraud was rampant in Egypt's cult centers. The idea behind it, the priests and ritual ceremony staff responsible for mummy preparation forged them and sold them expensively to pilgrims and others who wanted to present these mummies as votive offerings. Sometimes we have things that look like a cat or an ibis, but when they've been opened or x-rayed, we find that they might have either a human bone or the bone of some other creature or just a bundle of feathers. And there's a lot of speculation about these sort of false mummies. So some people, they say, oh, the priests were just trying to defraud. There was an archive from a priest called Hall, and he was in charge of the ibises, and so this was a lot of letters and complaints and saying the people of the ibis are not looking after them, they're not feeding them properly, they're scrimping on their, their food and drink, you can't treat the gods like this. At the University of Munich's Egyptological Library, Jessica Itzak and Melanie Flossman are looking for information about tombs that were heavily damaged or even destroyed. From 1842 to 1845, the German scholar Karl Richard Lepsius headed a major Prussian expedition to Egypt and Ethiopia, commissioned by the king. All of the finds were meticulously documented, 
and even today, they are still a fascinating source of information. Do you think this is a pet close to the hunter? Yes, you can tell by the dog collar that it's wearing. And look, the dog's biting the desert animal's tail. Since the beginning of pharaonic culture, dogs were very important companions for people. We found very many child burial sites in Tunel Gebel with a little mummified cat or dog. One can assume that parents wanted the pets of their very young deceased children to accompany them into the hereafter. This way they wouldn't have to make the difficult journey alone. Mm. I love cats, which is why I developed a special interest in the pets of ancient Egypt, especially cats and dogs, when these pets weren't viewed as deities, like the cat of the ancient Egyptian goddess Bastet, and just played a role in people's private lives. What did cats mean to people? Were they really seen as cuddly little tigers, the way we see them too? Some may be surprised at these insights into ancient Egypt's love of animals. Today's animal lovers, however, will feel an immediate connection to the like-minded inhabitants of the old pharaonic kingdom. One special case involved the son of Amenhotep III, Prince Thutmose, whose mummified cat shared a grave with him in its own stone sarcophagus. This shows me that the connection between humans and animals was just as strong back then as it is today. Melanie Flossman's Research Institute is housed in the building where Munich's former Nazi party used to be headquartered. A building of historical significance where original filing cabinets, housing technology and an air raid shelter from this period can still be found in the basement. Patrick Brose is examining the archive of the first excavation that was conducted in Tuna El Gebel's animal necropolis some 100 years ago. This archive, which contains detailed excavation plans and, most importantly, hundreds of photos, is of tremendous scientific value. Fragile glass plate images show finds from that excavation as well as show the condition of the tombs before they suffered damage. The eye is nicely preserved. A wealth of precise information about these irretrievable treasures presents itself to today's archaeologists. Beneath it is a coffin. It was photographed together. Perhaps the mummy and the coffin belong together. Mm -hmm. An analysis of the archive also provides important clues on where launching a new excavation might be worthwhile. Bearing a stack of historical excavation plans, Melanie Flossman and Patrick Brose make their way to the Munich Institute for Art History for a final team conference prior to departing for Egypt. The excavation director will prepare her team for the work that lies ahead over the coming months. The plan for the animal necropolis is as follows. The focus will be on the main corridors, where the ritual chambers for the deified ibis and baboons are located. Our goal is to fully digitalize a corridor section. We want to provide a 3D model. And of course, we also hope to find additional cult chambers for ibis and baboons. The excavation team has returned to Egypt. Locals had stumbled upon a collapsed stone shaft located above the animal necropolis. The young man who found the shaft tomb is now a member of the team. The new find has electrified the archaeologists. Melanie Flossman immediately altered her plans. The complex chamber tomb presumably belonged to an important priest of the animal sanctuary. Exploring it takes priority over everything else right now. After clearing away rubble and drifting sand from the access shaft, the chamber tomb can now be explored. Yaku, Patrick, how many lamps do you have down there? I'm sending another two down. Okay. 
The excavators climbed 10 meters down the narrow shaft of the tomb that was carved into the rock by ancient stonemasons. The first impression of the base of the shaft, however, is sobering. The tomb chamber has been completely devastated. I have no idea by whom and when the tomb was last entered and how it was so badly damaged. The tomb has been laid to waste. Even the mummies were destroyed. Not one was found intact. We found a leg next to a head, next to ribs, and some vertebra. I ask myself who was in here and smashed everything to bits. I don't believe this happened in Coptic times. So uh, let's try to go down at the same level and see uh, when we reach the ground floor. OK? Good. Rubble from things that filled the tomb is strewn all over the place. At first glance, one can't make out much. The sand needs to be carefully sifted through. Sweat-inducing work at temperatures exceeding 40 degrees Celsius, and the dust makes breathing more difficult. Hours of searching is rewarded when Jessica Itzak first finds the middle section of an Ushabti statue. These clay figurines were meant to do the work of the deceased, as servants in the afterlife, just the way the elites were used to things during their life on Earth. The excavated material is heaved out of the shaft to be re-sifted. Mustafa Farouk yeah. then finds a second figurine. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> Let me have a look. Mm. Oh, it's with inscriptions again. Mm. It's your day, Mustafa <laughs> Mabrouk. <laughs> yeah. Mm. It's a very nice piece. Yes. The mm. tomb is located near the animal necropolis, so this could be the tomb of a high priest of Tot, mm. yeah. But now I'm really surprised because we have the title of a scribe, yes. so Sesh, but um, I cannot read um, the other hieroglyphs. Mm. So we have to check in the house. The finds are first registered and then carefully assessed at the excavation house. It can't, after all, be counted out that something particularly precious is among them. The servant figurines had no value to tomb raiders, and were carelessly destroyed during their plundering raids. El Shema Mohammed and Jessica Itzak reconstruct some of the figurines from the many shards. Inscriptions offer important clues as to the origin and official function of the tomb owner. That's nice, look how beautiful he is. Yes. Oh, it's beautiful, we have to tell Melanie. And described and I think beautiful color also. Oh, that's a nice blue, yeah? Yes, you're right. We can fit it with some. Sure. Which one is blue? Oh, the next to it. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, we have a pair. Yeah. It's yeah. perfect. We just call them Anton and Antonina. <laughs> In a newly discovered burial chamber, excavators have uncovered its back wall yeah. and are talking about their discovery. This white limestone might have been the lid of a sarcophagus. It's completely shattered, just like in the first chamber. If we get lucky, it might be another burial chamber. The mountain range, stretching along the Nile's west bank, was an ideal final resting place for inhabitants of the Pharaonic kingdom. Those who could afford it had a tomb chamber carved into the rock. Regular Egyptians were buried in the sand. Digging and outfitting the tombs was done by highly specialized craftsmen. As eternal reminders of their life of plenty, tomb walls were decorated with magical formulas and illustrations depicting the daily life of the deceased. The deceased was to carry on leading the same life in the beyond as they did on Earth. The tomb owner was to lack for nothing in the hereafter, it seems that the old Egyptians were obsessed with achieving everlasting life through rituals and mummification. The question as to why gigantic burial sites were established for animal mummies has, on the other hand, never been fully answered. British archaeologists have invited Melanie Flossman to Manchester to share information on their latest research results. 
the Museum of the University of Manchester, Lydia McKnight works as a specialist for animal mummies. Indeed, Manchester is a world leader in the area of mummy research. When we CT scanned this crocodile, we discovered there's a kind of depressed fracture mm -hmm. in the roof of the skull. And we think that's probably how this animal died, um, because it's a major injury, which has completely destroyed the vault of the skull. So it seems to be some kind of blunt force trauma, as though it mm -hmm. was hit over the head. Or it could be um, a ritual after death to kind of magically well, prevent it pre from coming back to life. A lot of these animals that we see that are mummified did not meet their end in a nice way. Some of them were bashed over the head, some of them were strangled, some of the puppies and the kittens were taken away from their mothers when they were very young, and so they just died. We don't know if poison was ever used, but it was also the act of giving a sacrifice and at the same time, the animal was going off and being from just a lowly dog or cat to being transformed into a divine entity. So here are some of the treasures of Manchester Museum. Dr. Campbell Price is responsible for a large collection of ancient Egyptian mummies in the climate-controlled storage rooms. This is where Already in 1896, X-ray technology was first used to examine an embalmed animal. Researchers associated with the Manchester Mummy Project gained new insights into mummies using state-of-the-art methods that caused no damage to the exhibits. The collection not only encompasses mummified people, the storage cabinets are full of animal mummies. We have the mummy apparently of a falcon covered in gold. Wow. Nice. That's really nice. Yeah. This cat mummy is from Beni Hassan. <laughs> Beautifully modeled and yeah. attractive. But we've got wonderful false ears here mm -hmm. and then little button eyes. <laughs> They've really tried to model the feline features. Mm -hmm. So um, is there really a head inside? The head is actually just modeled. It's just made from linen. This is another cat that we know came from the site of Beni Hassan, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it came into Liverpool, into the docks on one of the mm -hmm. ships in 1890, so it was part of a very large consignment. Liverpool is still one of Great Britain's major ports. Magnificent port buildings are reminders of a glorious past when Britain proudly ruled the oceans of the world. Britain's merchant fleet brought goods and raw materials from across the globe to Liverpool via the Mersey. Among these goods, however, there might also have been beloved dead pets of the old Egyptians. One of the most unusual uh, cargo consignments that arrived in 1890 uh, was a ship filled with 180,000 cat mummies. Uh, from the site of Beni Hassan. This was used, we think, originally as ballast to help balance the ship when it left Egypt. And the contents, this very strange cargo of mummified cats, was sold off to local farmers as fertilizer for their uh, fields. Now, fortunately, amongst the farmers, there were uh, some museum curators who, who bought some of those mummified animals, and that's why uh, Manchester Museum has some of these precious uh, cat mummy specimens. This story of the uh, shipment of animal mummies coming into the Liverpool dock would have been widely read uh, by the interested public. And so here, uh, they're making fun of the idea and illustrating a sense of, of threat and fear and uh, suspicion about ancient Egypt and about animal mummies. A shocking story for us today. Human and animal mummies were ground up in the 19th century and scattered onto fields and gardens. Their high phosphate and calcium content made them good plant fertilizer. The University of Manchester's museum curator tends to the precious mummy collection. It's kind of slumped a bit inside mm -hmm. when you look at the, mm -hmm. at the scan, but it's in there, mm -hmm. yeah. So this is our X-ray. 
So this is looking the side view. There is a complete cat um, wrapped inside. You can just see we're looking at the side view here of the coffin mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and inside is completely hollow mm -hmm. and within that hollow the embalmers have placed the cat mummy. Do you also have so-called fake mummies to show me? We do, yes, I can show you some now. Mm -hmm. This is one of our surprising mm -hmm. mummies. Crocodile mummy. Certainly looks like a crocodile mummy. It actually has some quite surprising contents. Mm -hmm. It doesn't contain a single crocodile mm -hmm. as you might expect it to, mm -hmm. but it has parts of eight crocodiles. Eight. Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. so it's got four skulls mm -hmm. arranged in a line mm -hmm. and then four very small hatchling crocodiles mm -hmm. placed above, below and to either side of the skulls. And something about the age? We think the, um, the animals to which the skulls belong mm -hmm. are mm -hmm. probably um, a couple of months maximum. Only a couple of months. And then the mm -hmm. baby ones really are newly hatched. They're mm -hmm. very, very small indeed. Mm -hmm. So can you see that we have yeah. a stick here? Mm -hmm. That basically fills the false head of the crocodile. Mm -hmm. So Earlier. the head is really... there's nothing? It's no, like just, no, it's uh, just formed. Linen and... Exactly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then the skulls start here mm -hmm. and are placed all the way down like mm -hmm. that. And then the babies are above, below and to either side of the skulls. A part can symbolise the whole because you can't always get a whole um, eagle or falcon or what have you. So if you want to make many mummies, you can divide it into pieces, put each piece in one bundle, and then by saying the prayers, it will come into being. In the autumn, Melanie Flossman and her team will start new excavations on a plateau above the animal necropolis. We hope to find additional evidence in the archives on what it was like to live in the settlement, among other things of priests and the people who lived here. The archaeologists take the same path that was used 2,000 years ago to climb up to the excavation site. The hill crest was once densely developed. Festively decorated, the processions wound their way up to the hilltop sanctuary, covered in a veil of frankincense and to the shrill sounds of the musicians. This is the settlement's main temple with its pillared hall. We don't know if there's a connection between the temple, the settlement and the animal necropolis, but they are located on the same axis. If two temples are aligned, there's a strong likelihood that they also had a connection in terms of their religious, ritualistic nature. Tuna El Gebel's animal necropolis is part of the town cemetery of Hermopolis Magna the ancient capital of an upper Egyptian district. Today, we often still use the names given to these towns by the Greeks. Hermopolis was the religious center of Thot, the god of writing. It was one of the kingdom's three most important cultic centers. An up to 130 meters wide grand boulevard led from the Nile metropolis of Hermopolis, Himenu in ancient Egyptian, to the mountains in the west. Annual processions held in honor of Thoth, the city god, took place here. There would have been regular festivals at these temples, maybe twice a year, maybe more. Pilgrims would come and they would purchase these animal mummies as well as votive offerings. And there would be a great big ceremony of consecration. And then twice a year, maybe more, the priests would then take all of these mummies after they had been consecrated in the temple and take them down and bury them in the catacombs and seal up the catacombs. Hi. 3,000 years ago, this temple complex was a breezy suburban settlement of Homopolis Magna. How are you? How is your work? We're hoping for numerous document finds that can provide us with names and occupations. We want to know how the cult of sacred animals was organized here. In an ancient refuse pit at the edge of the settlement, excavators find bones belonging to gazelles. Food waste from ancient Egyptian times suggests that flourishing savanna grasslands used to dominate this area, with many wild animals that could be hunted. Now. This area is a bleak desert. 
For scientists, this region's extreme dryness is a godsend because it preserves organic materials. The team's special focus is on texts written upon a papyrus plant. What's the situation with papyrus? We have some papyrus as well. That's wonderful, show it to me. You can still recognize the Greek letters. One, two, three, four, five, six lines of Greek. We have various documents here, which is fantastic. What did you find today? We found these palm branches which were still tied together with the hemp rope. And this has been preserved too. We also have stucco fragments in various colors, probably hand-painted grapes, black grapes, white grapes. None of the houses we've unearthed in the priest settlement had this kind of ceiling construction. More and more details about the daily life of the inhabitants of Tuna el Gebel come to light. They lived in courtyard compounds that included stables and food warehouses. Their bakeries had millstones for grinding up grains and furnaces for baking bread. Potters already plied their trade in Nakada 5,000 years ago. Since that time, Millions of these vessel types have been shaped out of mud from the Nile in large workshops and then fired in furnaces that have hardly changed at all. The craftsmen of today still work tirelessly. In Tuna el Gebel, animal mummies were also buried in such clay pots. They were caretakers of birds, there were people who fed them, there were other people who embalmed them. There must have been a huge bureaucratic assemblage dealing with the situation. And if excavations can bring out some more texts, we really might have a better understanding of this fantastic world of animal cults. The archaeologists are taking their search for written sources about the Tuna El Gebel Animal Cemetery to the entire area and the team's arduous search is rewarded. Scientists discover wall inscriptions even in remote spots. The inscription's characters are weather-worn and difficult to read. But Melody Flossman is optimistic. The photos that were taken using a specialized technology are to be deciphered digitally. Here you can see a red line, and down here is a demotic inscription. Following this year's excavation campaign, Melanie Flossman returned to her research institute in Munich. In her baggage, 3D scans from the burial chambers, along with text fragments that were found. She hopes that they will reveal something about the people behind the animal cult and the type of relationship they had to the animal mummies. To decipher inscriptions on the Ushabti figurines, Flossman will get help from an expert on ancient Egyptian hieroglyphics. Alexandra Schütze discovers information regarding the occupation of the deceased who was buried with this Ushabti. What's significant about this Ushabti is the title given in the first line. It tells us that our Kem was head of the district writers. We know that, among other things, they were responsible for registering harvest taxes in Egypt. It's really remarkable that a taxman of his status let himself be interred in such close proximity to the animal necropolis. The short hieroglyphic text points out the close relationship between the pet cemetery and the kingdom's tax authority. But there is no evidence on whether the priesthood faked animal mummies to enrich themselves or other high-ranking officials. It does become clear, however, that mummification was a money-making venture rather than about a love of animals. 
I think that the idea that an animal cult was all about being nice to the animals is completely wrong. But maybe the ancient Egyptians took a bit better care of their livestock than some do today, because they realized this was the only way to earn their living. So they would do their best to feed their donkey well, as we know from some texts. In Egypt, many traditions have endured from antiquity. On festive days, donkeys are still attended to as they were during the Pharaonic kingdom. They are adorned with the same magic symbols that were used on sacred animals in the temples. Incomparable animal cults emerged there some 5,000 years ago. Egyptian deities were portrayed with the heads of dogs, cows, birds, crocodiles, or cats. In this land, along the River Nile, humans and animals had a very special relationship, even beyond death. Thank you.